Welcome to Trillions. I'm Joel Weber. And I'm Eric Valchunas. Eric, we haven't spent that much time talking about trends year to date. Right. And that's something I do a lot in the rest of my job here is to track the flows. The flows. Yeah. It's every year. It's almost like a horse race. You know, it's year to date flows. So now we're in June and we've got uh, an update on the horse race. It Where feels is the more money like moving? a basketball game. I got to be honest with you. It's halftime. OK. Give me a bird's eye view. What's happened in the first half? So this was not a normal year. Last year, everything was like utopia. Everything was going up, namely U.S. equities. This year and was everything com- was going up together, which yeah. is also unusual. So ETFs were just exploded, four hundred and eighty-six billion in flows last year. Everything took in money practically. This year was much harder. Now ETFs up to this point have taken in one hundred and twenty-seven billion dollars. Now this time last year they had taken in almost two hundred billion. Now keep in mind, yes, they're underperforming, but it's a rougher market. And if you look, active mutual funds are negative, not by a lot, but they haven't taken in any money. So $127 billion in this environment is pretty good. And unlike last year, where it was all U.S. equities leading the way as usual, especially after since Trump won, it's been a U.S. equity flow-a-thon. U.S. equities were- Flow-a-thon, I like that. Sounds fun, doesn't it? Yeah. I, yeah. You know, I like a basketball game better, but okay, flow-a-thon it is. But something magical happened in early May- that sort of put us back on a 2017 type US equity flowathon which was lacking the rest of the year do you know what happened in early may that sort of completely changed the trajectory of flows away from say being a fixed income kind of year to being much more of a US equity kind of year like last year what happened i am racking my brain to remember early may and you're just going to have to help me out two words warren buffett oh warren buffett unexpected I've only seen two people have the ability to single-handedly change the trajectory of flows. We should have done flows. this as 20 questions. We could have just done the whole <laughs> episode as 20 questions. The first is the Fed chair. Whoever that is, when they talk, the flows change. That happened already. And Next is what Trump. Yeah. Trump is able to move flows pretty regularly. Buffett did it. What he did is he came out and he said he was buying, I think it was 75 million shares worth of Apple, which was adding to more of his Apple holdings. And it was over that weekend of the Berkshire annual meeting. And I guess it was the spiritual lift the market needed. Plus, you had Apple doing buyback just before that. So that really got people going. And since then, there's been a nice rally. And U.S. equity ETFs have taken in a lot more and sort of made up for lost ground earlier in the year. But anyway, that kind of brings us up to where we're at right now, which is a little less than last year. But the assets are more spread around after Buffett. And so we're going to drill into that this episode and actually look at where the flows and outflows have come from. And joining us again, one of our favorite episodes, we had a guest named Todd Rosenbluth, who's the director of mutual fund and ETF research at the CFRA. Todd is back for this episode. Yeah, Joel, instead of Ted 2, this is like Todd 2. There's nobody better to pick apart first half flows than, than Todd. He is a bona fide ETF nerd. This week on Trillions, Halftime with Todd Rosenbluth. All right, Eric, I, I'm looking at a bunch of printouts. First, we're going to talk about inflows. Second, we're going to talk about outflows. Third, we're going to talk about performance. Inflows. What do you notice? Right. So I'll just throw out the top inflow leader of the year is a ticker IEFA, which is the iShares Core MSCI EFA ETF. EFA is essentially an acronym that we know that's international developed markets. So mainly it's Europe and Japan. And that has taken in $17 billion. And keep in mind, that is a 40% increase on assets. So IEFA is far and away the flow leader. The next one on the list is $7 billion. But let's focus on IEFA. Todd, what's your take? What is driving all of the traffic here? Yeah, I think it's a couple of things. One is that in prior years, investors were underexposed to developed international. They were favoring U.S. equities. It was a very home biased for U.S. investors. And so international equities did relatively well last year. Investors wanted to rotate and make sure they had exposure to it. The second thing is investors are, as we'll see with the rest of the flows, investors are increasingly looking at lower cost products. So while IEFA was the by far the biggest gainer of new money, a companion product that's more expensive from iShares, EFA, which has a higher expense ratio, largely similar portfolio, uh, was the second biggest in outflows. But you can still see a big difference, about a $10 billion difference net inflows 
between those two products. So there is still demand for developed international investing this year. Just to explain that price differential, EFA is 0.32%. IFA is 008 so doing the math there, that's four times cheaper. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's enough. And what was interesting about this, this year we saw a $5 billion trade, actually $5.6 billion, out of EFA into IFA. So almost a third of that $17 billion one trade. was one trade. I believe it was Merrill Lynch's model portfolios. They put all the FAs in. And they basically were able to move that much money in the course of two or three days. It was, uh, as far as we know, the largest ETF trade on record. Wow. And that was just because... Even the big fish want it cheaper if they can, and IFA had started to gain enough liquidity over the years that it became uh, formidable for someone big to use it, whereas before when it first came out, even though it was cheap, it wasn't liquid enough for the big guys. But now this thing is trading about half a billion a day, which is almost good enough for anybody. Yeah, and I think it's similar. What you know, what's number two on the list of inflows is IEMG, which is another low-cost product from iShares. It's a cheaper version of EEM, the, their more incumbent emerging market product. You get a slight difference in exposure. The core series of products from iShares has some small and mid-cap exposure, uh, but it, these still are market cap weighted. So the largest companies, Nestle, for example, in IEFA and Samsung, for example, in IEMG, are still the, the same large companies in the cheaper and the more expensive products. And I'm noticing another trend, which is number three, IVV, also iShares, right? So, And actually, number four, SHV, also iShares. So I would put, before we get to SHV, because that one's unique, IVV, if you look at the flows for last year, 2017, the top three were the same. IFA, IMG, IVV. It did a slightly different order. But this is what we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago with Martin Small, what I call the four-headed monster these are dirt cheap ETFs that make up each a big slug of your portfolio. You throw AGG in there, which is your U.S. aggregate bond. That is number six on the list. Those four ETFs are taking in a third to 40% of all the money because you get an entire portfolio for you know, six, seven basis points all in. But let's look at VEA. VEA is a competing product on there. VEA would be a competitor to IEFA. And And that's number six. Yeah. So again, like what Todd was saying, some people are rotating to international. What's the difference between IEFA and VEA if you were advising somebody which one to pick and what they should think about? Because they're both cheap. Right. They're both cheap. So you investors just need to be mindful if you want to use iShares and Vanguard together is the way that the index behind this is going to be different. So VEA tracks an index that's offered or that's available from FTSE Russell. FTSE Russell uh, includes in developed markets Canada as well as South Korea as part of the portfolio. Canada is not part of IEFA. The EFA part doesn't include a C in that. There's no, it's not KIFA, so to speak. So there's going to be no Canadian exposure. And South Korea is considered an emerging market according to MSCI. And at the risk of getting too far in the weeds, if you used one iShares product and one Vanguard product that's from this list here, you could either be doubling down your exposure in certain countries or you could be having a hole in certain countries depending upon how you structure that. Based based on the indices. Based on the indices that's there. Bottom line, you should use them as a set, right? If you go IAFA, you should also do IMG. If you go VEA, you should use VWO and not mix and match in that case. Or do so with a full awareness that you're doubling down. So if you really like South Korea, for example, and you want exposure to it, that's a way of doing it. Or you want to really think that Canada is a part of it, then then yes. But certainly going into buying an ETF, not just because it's the cheapest one, because a lot of the ones that are on the top gainers this year or top asset gatherers this year are cheap. But they're not the same products. It's Mm -hmm. not just one basis point cheaper than the other. So, I mean, cheapness is a trend. Um, There's also some tickers that are sort of boring. SHV? Yeah, so SHV is um, fascinating. It's never on the top 10. This is the iShares short treasury bond ETF, which holds uh, treasuries that are really short term. It's almost like a money market fund or like putting your money under a mattress or cash. And for it to take in, you know, uh, what is it, 6.2 billion, that's a 78% increase in its assets. And this brings us to. What's going on there? Well, earlier in the year, remember when volatility was going crazy? Everybody, when they get scared, this is the kind of stuff they run to. So they put it under the mattress and they didn't take it up. Right. And so ultra short-term and short-term debt ETFs, all told, took in about $24 billion, which is way punching above their weight because they only make up 1% of the assets. 
What's your take on that? You think that money's going to come back out, Todd, if the market continues to rally? I think part of that's in there in part because the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates and is on a path to continue to raise interest rates further. And so short-term and ultra-short-term products aren't going to go down. You know, when, when the usually bonds go down in value and bond ETFs go down in value as rates spike higher, this is a flight to safety and a flight to liquidity. I don't think it's parking there. I do think there's there's money that's going to stay in there for a period of time. And it's, you know, SHV is one of them, but we're seeing floating rate bond products. Uh, I think FLOT is, is one of the top ones as well. But it, you're actually, we're seeing it from various products. You know, JP Morgan has a product, uh, JPST, as an example, that just launched late last year. And I think it's already above $500 million in assets already based on net inflows. There's a lot of demand that's out there for short-term products. I think that's going to continue uh, as we move it to the second half of, of this game. So it's a little bit like how Eric uses a jacuzzi, where you just like get in, relax a little bit, and then get back in the game. Well, to some, I think some, you know, some of the money that rotates is going to stick. Those people are just going to hang in the jacuzzi until they get all wrinkled and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And then you got to get out. Yeah, other people are going to get out. This top ten list is a good mix and of of products that tend to cater to both the sort of quick hit types and also the more long-term. Uh, but SHV and SHY are two products that you see have grown over the last five years. So, yes, it's a quick hit this year, but they've steadily grown. And I think they're actually replacing uh, other vehicles that people use back in the day for places to park cash or hide out from rates. Yeah, I mean, so money markets obviously are a place where people have hidden out. And, and you know, we, we're obviously talking about this on an ETF show, but money is moving from ET or into ETFs from from mutual it's funds. It's bigger than that, Todd. It's a cultural phenomenon. This show definitely is. But because we're you know, if rates are going up and if the returns are going to be lower, you want to pay as little as possible. And so these products, ETFs in general or bond ETFs tend to be significantly cheaper than actively managed mutual funds. And so if if the returns are going to be relatively muted, you want to pay as little as possible. So number uh, six is ag, which I think we've hit on with what we've been talking about with bonds. Uh, number seven, float, F-L-L-T, also bonds. Uh, number nine, momentum, M-T-U-M. That's a shocker. Why? Right? Well, because it, it's kind of hasn't come from oblivion per se, but it only had about, you know, a couple billion last year. Now it's taken in, it's basically doubled in size in the past um, six or seven months. And this hasn't been the most exciting year for stocks. So it is interesting that momentum would be that high on the list. Yeah, a couple of things. One, what we've seen this year is that the winners of last year, in many cases, have continued to move higher. And this is basically a, a let your winners run approach. The the stocks that get in have performed relatively well and have strong relative strength and strong technical metrics from a momentum perspective. And so that's tech or that was tech at the end of the year, and tech has done relatively well. Which explains number 10. Which which explains number 10 as well. Uh, The second thing is we at CFRA, we do individual research on on ETFs, 1,400 in total. We decided to write about MTUM for the month of June as our focus ETF, and we did so because we were pleasantly surprised that despite the strong run uh, for many of the stocks inside the portfolio, we still, our analysts still felt they were, many of them were still undervalued. Some of those are bank companies, some of them uh, in the financial sector, some are technology stocks like Cisco and Intel. And I believe it actually just rebalanced. Um, and I saw one of your one of the members of the team here posted on Twitter in June just examples of stocks that made it in. Additional technology stocks have rotated in. This is not unlike the ag or IVV. Uh, products, this does rotate and rebalance uh, every six months. And so it's something for investors to be top of, top of mind. Yeah, uh, I'm looking right now, MTUM, the tech weighting is 41%. So you're getting a lot of tech here. Okay, so there's there's some, some themes that I noticed. Cheapness being one, tech being another, S- things that did well last year. What do you got? How do you guys feel about this top 10 for inflows? I, I'm not surprised to see. I think many of the names are what you would expect in the market, which has been expectations of, of bonds declining in value. So investors hiding out in that and then continued demand for international investing. I, I think the the fact that we have a single factor product, MTUM, and we have net inflows for the triple Qs, which is often seen net outflows 
it, it's been around for a while, but as money has flowed out of it over time, I think is encouraging that there's still adoption of ETFs to be had. And I also think that this top 10 list, when the market's a little shaky, a lot of times that will clear off some of the crazy hot trends. I think MTUM is one example where that, that does end the cues. Uh, and what it will leave with is the huge secular shift from like high cost mutual funds into low cost ETFs. A lot of this money was going to come over no matter what was going on. So I think this is like a baseline that you can expect to see for a while. I think half these ETFs, maybe even 60% of them, are probably going to be on the top 10 list for a long time. It's the floating rate debt ETF, the momentum, which I think will come and go. Look, you got to, iShares and Vanguard are just so dominant. The Qs on there is Invesco, but outside of that, I mean, I haven't gone down to the top 25, but you're probably looking at 23, 24 of the top 25 or two companies. And I bet if we look at the flows in the first quarter, I did this when there was volatility. Still, 90% of the money goes to products that charge less than 20 basis points. So even with as volatile or its utopia, there's nothing like dirt cheap. Okay, so we talked about inflows. Part two, let's talk about outflows. Number one, this is a shocker. Spy, also known as spiders, also known as the first ETF. I can keep going. <laughs> on, go, also no, known as well, the largest ETF. Well, when you're the largest ETF, you know, that you can obviously gain as, as the pie continues to expand or when there's a lower cost alternative uh, as there is, you know, there's two of them actually, IVV and VOO that are on the top 10 list. Some of that money that's going into those respective products are coming out of SPY, uh, SPY, and then SPY tends to be used more by, from a trading perspective, mm-hmm. institutional investors that are trying to position ahead of something or using it as a hedging vehicle. So it tends to either be the biggest from an inflows or tends to be the biggest from an outflows perspective year after year just because of its scale. Yeah, I agree. Spies got a crosshairs on it. IVV in particular is going after spies. It's a little cheaper, right? Spies 0.09%. IVV is 0.04%. IVV is starting to trade a little more. Uh, they're going to be going back and forth for a while. One thing about spy, though, is in the first month, January was a killer month before the vol came. Spy took in $19 billion in a month. And that was like uh, 25% almost of the whole month's flows. So it's sort of like when SPY is on, it carries mm-hmm. a lot of the weight. And when SPY goes away, when the hot money pulls out, what you find is SPY had $19 billion in outflows the next month. So <laughs> SPY will see flows in a day that would be like a lifetime for other ETFs. So a lot of the SPY volume and flows are money coming in and out using SPY instead of futures. But there is a sort of secular shift away inside baseball of IBV and VU sort of maybe – chipping away at SPY's long-term holders. Right, gaining assets. Yeah, because I mean, some of the products we talked about in the first segment, I guess the first quarter of this segment, to use the basketball analogy, even though it's halftime. It was time. a third. Okay. I don't, is that a cricket game? I don't know. I'm an American. I don't we're, know cricket. Yeah, uh, Sorry about that. It's a great mystery. But what we saw is you know, the difference between the iShares International and the Vanguard International. There are differences. The VU product, IVV, and SPY all hold the same exact... Stocks within the S&P 500, they all trade quite well. They all have significant volume behind it and and tight bid-ask spreads. So you're really not getting the difference and needing to go into the weeds and understand what's inside it. People are buying the cheaper product. So number two is EFA. We talked about that one in the first segment. Number three, LQD. What's that? LQD is the famous investment-grade corporate bond ETF, $4 billion. $4.5 $4.5 billion in outflows, that's 11% organic negative growth there. Here's the thing is a lot of people don't realize the, how uh, big the duration is on LQD. It's uh, like seven years, eight years, meaning that it's very sensitive to interest rates. So I think the Fed is why you saw some money come out of uh, LQD. I don't know if, Todd, you have anything to add? Yeah, I think what we saw is that the short-term bond products for, for much of the year in both investment grade and high yield, which we'll get to, took some of that share as investors were rotating to reduce the interest rate risk. So it's, again, important to not just look at the expense ratio or the liquidity of the ETF, but looking at the interest rate sensitivity that a product provides also. Number four, IWD. And number five, EZU, both iShares. The first one's the iShares Russell 1000 value ETF. Second one's iShares MSCI Eurozone ETF. So both iShares. What do you guys see in these two? Yeah, I mean, the the Russell 1000 series, 
uh, you know, the growth and the value are relatively expensive compared to other products that are out there that are either tied to the S and P five hundred that I, that iShares offers, or relative to Vanguard's lineup of growth versus value. So I, I think there's more of an incumbent base mm-hmm. that money is moving out of it. Uh, value is underperformed, or you know, this year relative to growth. So I think that may play a, a, a part as well as people have, we talked about earlier about momentum and and the triple Qs are much more growth oriented. Value is going to have more exposure to energy and financials. Yeah, just to give you some numbers here, IWD, which is the one with the outflows, is basically down one percent. Its sort of sister product, that's the growth version, is up eight point two percent. There you have it. I mean, that's really the story there. Another thing I noticed about the EZU, it's a Europe product, right? And we have another Europe product a little bit lower on the list, which is number 10 for redemptions. What's the difference between those two? Yeah, so, I mean, HEDJ, which is uh, the Wisdom Tree Europe hedge product, is, I think, poorly named. It's not just Europe. It's actually the Eurozone for what it is. So it's dominated. Todd has a pet peeve about this. Mm. Well, I, I just think yeah. you, should, you should know what's inside it the product. It doesn't have UK. It doesn't mm-hmm. have UK. It doesn't have Switzerland, which yeah. is well, 40% of- Well, trying to get out of the, out of the EU, so that yeah, but they don't. But they're not out of, ahead of its time. But they're not, ahead of, they're not out of Europe. You so know, they're still in the continent. You know and, what uh, again, Eric calls this, though? It's a great surfboard. Oh, right. The currency hedge DTFs, I did refer to them as the central bank surfboards. So HEDJ would basically- neutralize the currency and go long the stocks. And when the central bank was, uh, you know, keeping rates low and printing money, it was a great way to play that. Was it a long board or sort of a short board? This is a long board because all you had to do is get on that puppy and just ride it. Like Mm. there was, you don't have to be like, you know, Kelly Slater doing all the crazy moves. It didn't require that much trading, but it ended. And now you have uh, Europe is is down in general but the hedged is even down worse. Mm. You have to keep in mind, currency hedged ETFs were a phenomenon. They were like the hula hoop of ETFs a couple of years ago. They ruled the top 10 list. In fact, a couple of years ago, and Todd, you know, l- see if you agree with me on this, DXJ was the number one ETF in flows. I don't think we'll ever see a non-Vanguard or iShares on the top of the list again, but that's how, that was only three years ago. For, for, so for DXJ, and uh, I think the year after that, HEDJ might have been one or two. Yeah. It was an amazing situation going on. Everybody was getting in on that, and that trade has sort of like unwound big time. And it, but it's been a slow bleed of assets because it's a couple. It's been a couple of years, and we see both DXJ and HEDJ here. And well, we're not, we're not doing a program that's about the fund closures this year, but a lot of currency hedged ETFs that came out in that wave or following that wave have now shut down as money never flowed in to currency heads international products. So I think it is a long tail for some of these products. Well, but one more point on that. Um, only half the money that went into currency hedge ETFs has come out. In, I've seen this all. Every time there's a huge trend, usually half the money sticks. People either bought the story, forgot they bought it, or they're hanging in there. And I think cur- uh, the currency hedged wave taught people that they have a lot of dollar exposure, and maybe they do want half of their international hedged. Do you think, uh, Todd, that half of your international exposure, whether it's EM or it developed, should be hedged, or should you try to trade around it? Yeah, I think it's going to come down to do you understand the risk that's out there. So so some people will want to have it. You can do it from a, a pure currency hedge perspective. And the iShares suite of products and, and the DWS, the, the formerly Deutsche Bank products, do a currency hedge on that. The Wisdom Tree ones do a double down on the currency hedging because or the, the currency impact because there's exposure to not just reducing the, the euro or the, or the yen, but these are the companies inside it are significant exporters. So the revenues are coming from outside of Europe in the case of the European product and outside of Japan in the case of the Japanese product. So I think that's I think there's a role for these in, in, in someone's portfolio, but you have to be aware that that trend is going to go against you just as much as it's going to go for you. Okay, so number six on the list, J and K, junk. I think this is kind of funny because when we're talking about inflows, bonds everywhere. Talk about outflows, different type of bond. It's in massive uh, flight. Well, yeah, J and K, I think, is much more like an equity. Um, it's also got a duration of, I think, four or five years, which isn't as bad as LQD, uh, meaning that it has got some rate risk. But ultimately, I think high yield just got hurt in the sell off from equities. And because you did see some flows into um, the cheaper junk bond ETF, HYLB, which is the Deutsche Bank low cost. So even the junk bond space, you do see 
the sort of hot money moving around to where performance is, but you see the secular change out of HYG and JNK into the cheaper HYLB, which is 20 basis points to their 40. So JNK, I think, got hit by two things at once, being a little pricey and by just people wanting out of junk because uh, there was more of a risk-off trade, especially for the first three months. Yeah, in relation to JNK versus the short-term and floating rate bond products are, are significant ends of the of the spectrum on it. So you're, you're taking on much more risk from a credit perspective. Uh, investors fa- favored much more the reducing the duration, the interest rate sensitivity of the portfolio in the first half of 2018. Was HYG, which is number nine in the list, affected by that double whammy as well? Totally. Uh, both of them, JNK and HYG kind of um, sort of... Mirror each other, right? Yeah. They're like... Um, they're brothers who don't like each other. Ooh, yeah, I like that. yeah. They a few I shares always trashing J and K and vice versa. But they tend to their flows move very much similar. I think HYG is the sort of bigger, more popular product. But they're both. Um, it's not surprising they're both on the list with the outflows. That's what made HYLB's inflow so interesting, which was that they you know this cheap high yield bond ETF took in a billion. That just goes to show you that some people are still allocating, and that's what makes all flows tough to read is because. You've got people trading, and you've got people allocating. Mm-hmm. And allocating typically is more immune from what's going on in the market. Mm-hmm. So we're trying yeah, to suss out long-term investing. Absolutely. So I think uh, both JNK and HYG are not used that much by allocators. So that reflects trading trends. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, number seven, DXJ. We're going to skip that one because we've talked about it with the hedge stuff. Number eight. This one's sort of surprising to me. A Vanguard real estate ETF, VNQ. Yeah. Why, why is that on the list? Well, VNQ saw $2.5 billion in outflows, and um, this is a rate story. Basically, people rushed into re- REITs, which are passed through securities, which yield 6%, 5%. So when you can get you know 3% in a 10-year treasury, it makes that a lot less appealing. Not from everybody, but certainly some so wait, people- this holds REITs? That holds REITs, REITs, and it yields 5 or 6%. It was being used as a surrogate place for income. In fact, what's interesting is if you look at sectors, everybody's shocked to hear this. The sector with the most assets is real estate, not tech or energy or anything like that. Because this low-rate environment, uh, everybody needed yield, and REITs was a huge place. The one thing that was reliable, right? Right. So this is a little bit of an unwinding of what we many call the thirst for yield trade. Because it had more yield than a bond. Oh, a lot, yeah. It was yielding more than a junk bond. And, and you, you, we've seen that it's not on the list, but consumer staples, which is another defensive sector, I think had significant as collectively had significant outflows in the first half of the year. Also, what's interesting also just to, to point out is that VNQ has been changing. The index that's behind it uh, is changing. And so it actually has added in some specialty REIT companies, American Tower, Crown Castle, some more growth oriented companies. And that may not be as appealing for some investors that wanted the defensive, more traditional read exposure. No idea if anyone's actually selling because of it, but there is a change behind this that investors that may be considering VNQ may want to be be aware of. Closing thought about these outflows. Well, my closing thought is there's significantly more money going into the inflows than money that's going out of the outflows. So we still are seeing a very good year behind it, but it is still a tra- it's a trade towards lower cost products. And it's been more defensive-oriented fixed income products that really shined in the first half. And taking on credit or interest rate risk through fixed income hasn't been rewarding investors this year. And money is flowing out as well. Yeah, if you look at the top 10, I mean, I read it as, again, a a migration from high cost to low cost, as well as just this um, rising rate environment. Those are the two big, I think, uh, uh, straws that are stirring the drink. Okay, so we've talked about inflows, we've talked about outflows. Let's talk about some of the top performing ETFs year to date, right? We've had a lot of tickers, a little bit like alphabet soup. We're going to have a few more yet. And we're not going to look at leveraged or VIX VIX products, right? Yeah, that's not really, that's sort of like um, counting, it's like they're using steroids. We just want to look at the natural long only kind of stuff that did it the real way mm. whereas VIX and leverage they can go up they're usually going to be at the top and the bottom of the list right no muscle creams okay yeah right this uh, is we want Roger Maris not Barry Bonds so based on what we're looking at PSCH is top performing ETF here today yep. up 29.4% 
I had to look it up. These are tickers that I don't have memorized. And, you know, usually even in the long only area, if it's going to be the top of the list, it's probably something very specific and maybe concentrated. This is PowerShare's S&P Small Cap Healthcare. And looks like it's getting some kick from biotech. It's getting some kick from um, having small caps. That's They've been doing better this year. But ultimately, it's doing a lot better than both of those. So it's got some stock picking uh, probably um, help here by just owning some stocks that have gone up. Maybe there's been a few uh, acquisitions in there. But ultimately, this is sort of like a lottery tick, uh, ticket coming in. Todd, did you know that one? I, I did know that one. The the small cap sector products, I think, are, are quite interesting. Does We've, that make you a better analyst than Eric? It means I knew the the one that one on the list. There'll be some others on the list I had to look up myself because some of these are, are few and far between on this. But, he, but he's just trying to draw uh, drive a wedge between us. <laughs> hey, he wants to see some fireworks. <laughs> there, there, it's fine. There's only a handful of ETF analysts that'll talk on just about any topic, and Eric and I, I are found two, what, yeah, I found two of and them, and you found two of them in the room, and you haven't <laughs> locked the door, so. Small cap healthcare, you got a couple of things that are working out there. Small caps are doing relatively well, domestic focused as opposed to international. Uh, there's been some international tensions that have been going on. And you, you're getting diversification, though. So this is not just a pure single industry product. You are getting it not only biotech, but you're getting healthcare equipment. But what you're not seeing is the larger cap Johnson & Johnson Merck's that people tend to think of with healthcare stocks. Good product. There's a lot of good small cap products that are out there. The number two top performing ETF year to date, XWeb. What's that? Also up twenty nine percent, by the way. Yeah, so this is a um, uh, fairly new product. It's the Spider S and P Internet ETF, and I think FDN is right behind it. That's the First Trust Internet. Look, this come, brings us back to the endless tech rally. This is a uh, Internet ETFs, by the way. If you're looking for a Fang play, that's where you go. Internet ETFs typically have most of the Fang stocks, if not all of them, in high weightings. That's what's been driving uh, these. I think that's pretty much the story here. Yeah, and I mean, this is an example of this can be hidden gems out there. Uh, XWeb, I think, has under $20 million in assets under management. It's a relatively new product. People may have missed it. However, you may not want to chase that performance because it could be fleeting. You know, the tech rally has been strong, but as we talked about, it, you know, it could reverse itself. And just one more thing about the internet ETFs, FDN, which has a longer history. Which is number three year to date, up 25 25- percent and change. Right. Let's stretch back 10 years just to explain this is just like a relentless loop we're on with internet is that this thing's up 502 percent in 10 years. The market is up 161 percent. So, I mean, it's basically lapped it by three or four times. Mm -hmm. And that's just what's amazing. Um, Having internet and some and biotech, which I think is driving some of the healthcare ETF. If you go back and I'm telling you as an analyst every year, forget flows, but in performance, those two areas are just relentless. They're they're either near the top or at the top, biotech, internet, and it's just the same thing this year. Yeah, I mean, and the benefit of those industries tend to do relatively well. Obviously, with ETFs, you get the benefits of diversification. So you mentioned about M&A activity that can be happening within this space, specifically small caps or, or and the spider product, XWeb, is an equal weighted product. So you are going to get some small cap exposure to it. Not everything is going to go up, but you get the benefits of diversification, and you can look inside these products and, and get to know these companies. All right, Eric, when you look over the rest of this list of top-performing ones year-to-date, are there any other ETFs that pop to you? Yeah, NIB. NIB. I, the, every now and then, you just get some outrageous commodity. Mm. <laughs> that just either there's a f- number 11, by the way. Yeah, this is the iPath Coco. 22.8% year-to-date. Yeah, this is the Coco ETN. And, you know... So occasionally these kind of wacky commodities that you forgot about make it on the list. Like coffee was all the rage maybe like two or three years ago. It still is in my morning. (laughs) Right. You'd think coffee would be like on it every year given how much people drink it. But cocoa, um, you know, look, it's probably someplace where there's a, a, um, uh, a supply issue. And then boom, it spikes up. So it's interesting. It reminds me, by the way, and the reason I think it's interesting is just how ETFs have wrapped up everything. And I would be careful investing in like a cocoa ETM because it's holding futures, it's rolling, and typically it's down. If I go look at the five-year performance of the cocoa ETN, Todd, what do you Nib. think the performance is over the last five years? I would think you would have lost money. Down 8%, um, which isn't bad. It's better than I thought. But a lot of this is from rolling, and it's very complicated. But these commodity futures tend to pop up with the ones that track the single commodity. You'll find them here and there on the top 20. 
And I think what you also see here, based on the Bloomberg data that you made available to help me out for this effort, is there's net outflows. So usually you see money chasing performance. This is actually people take either taking chips off the table of a relatively small product to begin with. We're going to take our chips off the table. Todd Rosenbluth, thank you so much for your time. Good to be with you guys. Joel, I know you like your plugs. You do Business Week plugs all the time. I have one for myself. You know, we do audio, we have TV, but we occasionally do in-person appearances. It's like catching this live. And um, my colleague, Tom Serafagas, who was a guest on one of the episodes, he's great. He's going to be touring Europe, and we have four events planned for uh, four major cities there in Amsterdam, Frankfurt, Paris, and Zurich. Uh, starting next week through the next two weeks. So if you are in Europe and anywhere near one of those cities and you want to go, uh, you can go on the terminal and type SEMR to sign up or just send me an email, ebalchunas at bloomberg.net, and I will get you signed up for the event. It's free and there's going to be really cool. we got uh, some issuers there, Vanguard, etc. Um, so check it out. Thanks for listening to Trillions. Until next time, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal, bloomberg.com, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else you like to listen to podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Twitter. I'm at Joel Weber Show. He's at Eric Balchunas. And you can get Todd at Todd CFRA. Trillions is produced by Magnus Hendrickson. Francesca Levy is the head of Bloomberg Podcasts. Bye. Bye.